Welcome. Uh, my name's Nick. Let's talk about yoga today. How to stay consistent with your practice. Let's find out. So, you know, it's too bad that knowing something is good for us usually isn't enough to make us do it. I could cite mountains of evidence, but I doubt you need convincing that getting more exercise would probably be good for you. Unfortunately, knowing and doing seem to be governed by two entirely separate offices in the brain department. How many times have you resolved to start practicing yoga or start running or start going to the gym or whatever, only to lose commitment and give up? I spent years starting over and giving up and starting again before I finally managed to stick with the routine. And today I want to talk about some of the strategies that continue to help me stay consistent. You don't need to be especially gifted or disciplined. If I can do it, then so can you. So you'll need a piece of paper or notebook, or you can follow along with the workbook pages linked in the description. When you're ready, let's get started. Number one, being clear with your goals. Too many people begin practicing with nebulous, unspecific goals like be stronger or be more flexible or have more energy or be less stressed. No, these are your reasons for being interested in yoga, but they're not goals. I recommend setting up two kinds of goals for yourself, an objective goal that articulates exactly what you're working towards and a process goal that lays out your plan for how you're going to get there. So starting with the objective goals, we want our objective goals to be smart. Maybe you've heard of this or seen this before. Smart goals are specific. That's exactly what you want to do. They are measurable. That's something that can be objectively documented. They are achievable. This is something that you could conceivably do. They're relevant, something that matters to you personally, and they are time bound. It means it has a deadline when you want to have done this by. So let's look at this in the context of a yoga practice. I know that a lot of people will say that yoga isn't about chasing postures and they're not wrong, but setting challenging postures for yourself is a really simple way to establish an objective goal to work on. And you're going to see progress, improvement, as you keep practicing, and that will encourage you to practice more. I want to be strong and flexible enough to do a backbend for five breaths by the end of the year is a much clearer goal than I want to be stronger and more flexible. I know that there are some of you out there who just are not motivated by postures. And that's totally fine. If it's not a relevant goal for you, then it's not going to be motivating. But you will need to spend some time thinking about why you want to practice and how you're going to measure it. If you're motivated to reduce stress, for example, you might start measuring your blood pressure, uh, if it's to sleep better, there are biometric monitors like a heart rate monitor that can usually keep track of that for you. If you're motivated to lose weight, you can weigh yourself or measure your waist circumference. But you know, whatever it is, be clear because your objective goal is going to determine your process goal. Your process goal is really just a plan. It's going to tell you when you practice, it's going to tell you how long you practice for and what you practice. And it's going to be directly relevant to your SMART goal. And for this reason, I'm really not a fan of public classes. For starters, you don't have control of when, of how long, or what your practice is going to look like. So for example, suppose that you set yourself the goal of being able to hold a handstand for five breaths by the end of 12 weeks. You'll want frequent practices of short duration that relate specifically to doing inversions. 
if you spend your time going to public classes four days a week, doing all sorts of groovy things like lunges and backbends and hip openers, you'll probably feel good. You'll get better at those things, but don't be surprised if at the end of 12 weeks, you're not any closer to doing that handstand. For setting process goals, I recommend working with somebody one-on-one. -on -one. I recommend following along with videos that relate to your goal, or I recommend practicing on your own. Really, this is the only ways that you're going to have the kind of control you need over your schedule if you want to achieve the goals you set for yourself. So speaking of your schedule, write it down in your calendar when you're going to practice, what exactly you're going to practice. I can't tell you how many times I've arrived on my mat and spent my whole practice time just browsing and looking for the class that I want to do. Avoid that if you can. Choose the practice you're going to do before the time comes for you to do it. And don't set yourself up for failure by choosing a super, super ambitious practice schedule that you just can't maintain. It's not going to help. It's going to make you feel worse when you tell yourself you're going to practice and you don't. No matter what you've heard, practicing at 5 a.m. isn't inherently better at practicing at 5 p.m. Start with something modest and build a modest plan so that you can start gaining momentum. You can always go back and practice more later. So you've got an achievable goal that matters to you and you have a modest plan for how you're going to do it. The next thing that I recommend is that you start to keep track of your practice. How you do this is largely up to you. I use a notebook and write down how long I practiced and a couple of notes about what I did or how it felt. It doesn't need to be extensive. The whole point is that you start reinforcing the habit of practicing with some kind of visual record of how long you've maintained your practice streak. So it's good if you practice, but the days that you miss your practice, and there are going to be days that you miss, those are really the days where you have the chance to dive in and make changes to your life. Those are when you get to sit down and ask yourself some questions. Why did you miss practice? Was it an emergency? Emergencies happen. The universe will give you days off. But was it a real emergency? Or did you just use it as an excuse to skip? Could you have spent less time scrolling through social media and made it up later? Did you miss practice because you were spending time on something or with someone that is actually important to you, that's fine. Priorities are important. Or did you miss it because you were out late having drinks the night before with people who you don't even really like in the first place? You're not going to have enough time in the day to both practice and to be pulled every which way by the people and the projects that aren't really important to you. If you find that you don't have the time or the energy to stick to even a modest routine, then really looking at what you're spending time on and getting selfish is probably a good idea. I'm a fan of the Marie Kondo rule. If it doesn't spark joy, then toss it. Do the same things with people and activities. I had to stop drinking. It was getting in the way of the things I actually like to do, like improve my practice. Now, there are some relationships that you can't toss. Being selfish doesn't mean you can ignore your familial or work obligations, but at least begin to erect some mental barriers for the people who aren't bringing you joy or aren't supporting you in your goals. The point here with all of this is that you're using the days you miss practice as a chance to cull the unnecessary things out of your life. Don't beat yourself up, just use it as a learning opportunity. Finally, what about those times when you do have the time to practice, but you just don't? You have your alarm set to practice after work, 
nothing else is pressing for your attention, but instead you decide to continue rewatching The Office. Hmm. Let's look a little bit at how habits work and see if we can get them to work for us. Habits all follow the same pattern. We have some kind of sense impression that triggers us. The trigger cues us to desire something. We act upon that desire and we receive a reward. All this happens so quickly that before we realize it, we've gone from impression to action before we have a chance to think. So if this sounds familiar, if you find yourself in the habit of hitting snooze and going back to sleep or watching TV after work instead of following through with your plans, it might be helpful to try and pull apart this process to get some cognitive distance between the impressions that trigger you and acting upon them. So let's think about triggers. There are a lot of different kinds of triggers, time of day, how you're feeling, things that happen, people you're with, uh, your location, all of these different kinds of triggers can cue you to desire something. If you find yourself falling into habits that make practicing difficult, it's worth spending some time thinking about the impressions that trigger the behaviors you're trying to avoid and how you can make those triggers less obvious. Or if you can't avoid them, then prepare yourself mentally to resist the reward cycle that you know the impression is going to trigger. For example, if you know that you tend to stay up late scrolling through YouTube videos before going to sleep, try short-circuiting that behavior by keeping your phone on the other side of the room when you sleep. It's going to be really hard to try and willpower yourself into a consistent practice. It's much easier to trick yourself into consistency by hijacking that reward cycle. So make the impressions that's going to trigger your practice unavoidable. If you're trying to stick to a morning routine, for example, then set up your practice space the night before in a place where you can't avoid it. Or even better, if you have the space, then make a dedicated practice area in your home. You can try to find ways to make your practice more desirable. Honestly, I think this should be the easiest. Yoga feels good. If your yoga practice is painful and unenjoyable, then uh, something's wrong. Click the link in the description and we can fix that. Make it easy to do your practice. If you set yourself super ambitious, extra challenging routines to do every day, you're going to fall right off the wagon. When you're just starting, be happy with showing up and covering the basics. If you're looking for a beginner's routine to get started, check the link in the description. And finally, look for ways to make your practice more rewarding. Yes, you'll feel good after you practice and making progress towards your goals is rewarding, but to hijack your reward cycle, it can be really helpful to associate something pleasurable with finishing your practice. If you really want to rewatch The Office for the fifth time, then let that be your post-practice reward. You'll feel a lot better about indulging if you know you took care of your practice first. So that covers it. If you're trying to stay consistent with your practice, set an objective goal you can reasonably achieve, establish a modest plan that you can stick to, Keep track of your practice somewhere you can see a consistent record of your effort. Get selfish, start cutting the unnecessary activities and people out of your life, and hijack your reward cycle. Make the triggers to practice unavoidable and the rewards extra rewarding. Anyway, 
That's it for today. Like, subscribe, and share if this was helpful and you want to see more episodes like this one. If you're not already signed up, click the link in the description below to get these episodes and more beamed straight to your inbox. Thank you, and until next time.